Graham? Okay, just borrow me 30 minutes so we can be on our way. It's just that I can't fly over this. But we need to look at it. Just have your seat. Open your material to page 36. The whole of that material is about increasing our capacity for comeback, for revival, for restoration, for renewal. It's very important. And the whole of the material, I've just summarized it into three cogent points. So that's the point I want us to look at, and I will expand and enumerate. The rest of the material, you can go and read it for yourself. But because it's the theme of the conference, I just felt that I should touch it. I've been blessed already with the prayer, with the ministration of Reverend Hawkwalk and whatever. But let's look at this theme very well. I just want to summarize it in three sentences. Number one, capacity answers to the condition of your heart as a minister. And I will join that and I will give the scripture for that. Isaiah 66, verse number 2. Isaiah 57, verse number 15. Capacity answers to the conditions of your heart. You want God to increase you. You want mightier impact for your life or your ministry. It answers to the conditions of your heart. It's not in your outline. You won't find that one in your outline. I've told you. I said I'm summarizing the whole outline under three topics. I mean under three words. Or under three factors. Number one is the condition of your heart. If your heart is not contrite, if your heart is not humble, if your heart is not repentant, if your heart doesn't take rebook, if your heart doesn't have the fear of the Lord there, there's no comeback for you. And I'll give a classic example. In the book of Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they ended the story of Apostle Peter with him denying the Lord Jesus three times. He even swore that he doesn't know Jesus. And after he swore, Incidentally, to ladies, it was ladies that confronted him. One said, I know you, I've seen with that accused. He said, I don't know him. The other one said, You are a Galilean. Your language, your intonation resemble that Jesus that has just been arrested. He said, Lady, I don't know him. The third one said, but I've seen you with him. And I even saw you preaching. He said, well, light a lie. I said, I don't know him. Three cogent times. But Jesus had prophesied that he would deny him. After the third time, the Bible said Jesus looked at him. And Peter remembered what he said. Do you know what Peter did? The Bible said he went out and wept bitterly. That is his heart. There are a lot of people that are, they have gone away from the Lord. But I have a repenting. I have a crying. I have a weeping. I have a having a, a contrite heart over their sin. Over their going away from the Lord. No. We are using both face. We are using theology. We are explaining away. We are not concerned. God understands. That was what brought Peter back. He wept. The Bible says he went out and wept and checked the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They finished his story there. If you are not a good Bible reader, I'm surveying the Bible. Who told us how Peter was restored? You will come back. 
May God give you the heart to come back to him. Yes, sir, it's not a crime sometimes to fall down. But it's a crime to remain where you fall down to. It's a crime to justify your falling down. It's a crime to justify your sin, your transgression, your apostasy from the law. That is the greatest crime. Sometimes it's not a crime in our long walk with the Lord to serve the Lord. It's not a crime, sir. Maybe because of circumstances and situation that you find yourself to deny your Lord. Yes, yeah, sometimes it happens. But what is the greatest crime? Is to re stay down there. It's that you are walking and you fell down the railway line. And the railway is still far away and hooking at you. Get out of the way. Because the railway is not, going to, it's not going to wait for you. It's a crime for you to remain there. Because you fall down. Those of you who are falling, may the Lord raise you up. Yeah. I can't hear your amen. Yeah. Because Jesus saw the bitter cry of Peter. Some people are telling us today that we don't need to cry. Repentance doesn't mean cry. Many times repentance means crying. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible supports that. And sometimes when you are truly grieved and you truly know what you have done, the gravity, you will weep and cry. It's not the tears that matter. It's the condition of your heart. And that's what that Psalm 66 said. To this will I look. He that is of a contrite spirit that trembles at my word. Not physical trembling, but spiritual trembling. You tremble at the word of the Lord. You tremble at what you have done. How you have denied the one that loves you. And you decide to weep and cry. Even if that is the only thing you will do. You can weep. You can cry. He will restore you. When Peter did that. The Bible was silent. But you know John 21 picked up the team. It was in that falling condition. Peter said. I don't know what has happened to Jesus. I, as my Lord I have denied him. As my Lord I didn't obey him. He told me that I would deny him three times. And truly I denied him three times Before those young ladies Man, so I'm confused That's why he said I go out fishing And he went fishing And look at the negative influence You see whatever condition you find yourself Some people will follow you So it's you that will determine Either they will follow you to your destruction Or follow you to restoration Some people will follow you sir, Because whoever you are Somebody is following you you are a God to somebody. You are an example to somebody. You are somebody that somebody wants to become like. May we not be bad examples. Amen. Check your John 21 very well. Jesus came back. Because he will never abandon your tears. Sincere genuine tears. He will not abandon it. Sincere genuine repentance. He will not forget it. He came back to Peter. And you know he was the one who came searching. He came searching. He knew he's confused. Now, he has repented, but he's confused. He's doubting his Jesus again. That's why he came looking for him. God is still doing visitation, and he will visit you. Amen. I can't hear you, amen. amen. It was the one who came searching, because he saw his tear of the repentance. And read that John 21 again. You see, since the Lord gave me revelation of John 21, I can use it to preach many things. I see more than the ordinary day. I see more than what is written there. He was the one who came. And he didn't blame. He didn't castigate. He didn't say, Peter, as close as you are to me. Huh? Like our father we used to say, if they say it is uh, water that will, that will cook fish, I will never believe it. He didn't say that. Oh, you are looking for fish. The fish is here. Not only fresh fish, smoked fish. Children... Come and die. The ever spiritual John, who knew the voice of Jesus, he said, Peter, that is the master. That one says it's not possible. Well, has he woken up? What is he looking for here? He said, He's him. I can't miss that voice for any other voice in the whole world. May we not miss his voice. Yeah. And John came. The rest, seven or eight of them, came. But Peter, see, troubled by that guilty conscience. He remained in the river. Well, Jesus didn't pursue him more than that. What was he thinking? He said, see if I can see into the heart of Jesus. 
Well, when cold catch you, you will come out. At least you will not drown, sir. Huh? So I'm, I'm waiting. Oh. I'm sitting down, waiting for you. You anyway, eventually he came out. And when he came out, what did they ask him? He, came, he called him his original name. Simon, son of bad Jonah. Lovest thou me? Not on this thing. He said, Lord, you know. You know I love you. The summary? Peter denied him three times. And the Lord restored him. How many times? It's three times. He will restore you. Amen. But the bottom line is the condition of his heart. He was not gloating. He was not full of pride. Eh, hey, I deny you, I deny you. When then, what do you want to do? Who can stand before those ladies? He wasn't looking for excuses. He wasn't justifying his sin. He wasn't married to his sin. He was restored. Not only uh, to the position of a child or as an apostle or as a disciple, he was even promoted. That was when Jesus officially announced that Peter is the one that will lead the apostles. Because he told him, you love him more than this thing? Feed my sheep. The second time, feed my lamb. The third time, feed my sheep. I hope you understand what that one means. That the lambs are the young ones. The sheep are the mother. So what was he telling him? You have been restored. Lead this one for me. And the ones that will get born again through your ministry, lead them for me. You officially, you are their leader. Can I talk to somebody? Can I pray for somebody? That position, that assignment, that ordination, that God have ordained you, ordained your life from inception, that he called you, you will not miss it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Sin is a limiter, and it limits people. When you go out for one reason or the other, against God's clear will and instruction, it limits your future. If Peter had not wept, if he had not become contrite, become obedient and fearful, of losing Jesus, even though he had denied him publicly, but he went and prayed and sought the Lord. Even when he was confused, he has to come back to the Lord. May you not find any way to go except to the Lord. Yeah. Abby, is that a terrible prayer? May you not find anything, any way to go except the way of the Lord. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Okay, so the condition of your heart. We increase your capacity. When your heart is tender and soft, God cannot but promote and bless you. When your heart is sincere and honest, and you are, you are full of the fear of the Lord, He cannot but promote you. But I'm surprised that a lot of ministers have a hard heart. Things that break the heart of God doesn't break our heart again. No, that's a terrible condition to be. So make sure... Your heart is tender and soft. I need, I love, I want to read Isaiah 57. Look at it. Isaiah 57. I love that passage. Isaiah 57, verse number 15. Look at it. For those who the high and the lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. Look at that. With him also. That is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I just want to pray. May the Lord give us humble spirits. Amen. May He give us a heart, contrite heart Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Those are hearts that will not defend their sin and justify their sin and choose to remain in sin, but they will always come to the Lord. Say, Lord, search me. Anywhere that is wrong in me. Let the blood of your son wash it. That will increase your capacity. Very, very important. Number two, personal trainings and personal growth will improve your capacity. There are jobs, there are assignments, there are graces, there are ministries that God has committed into your hand. Unless you grow, unless you are trained, unless you improve yourself, unless you experience personal development, you will never get to that level. Very important. 
I'm a classic example of that. One of the best way to increase your capacity after you have a good heart and that heart keep on following the law is that you must go for training, sir. There are trainings that God will train you. And there are trainings that it is men who will use to train you. Especially when you are involved in church ministry. You need training. Constant training. You need growth. You need personal growth. You need personal development. And if you check your outline, they are there. They are there. That particular outline, they are there. The kind of training you must go for. There's no way you will succeed in this work without trainings, without empowerment, without equipping, without knowledge and wisdom. There's no way. Check the outline is there. So those of you that hate training, please repent. Please repent. And like I made allusion in the morning, even if God is speaking to you face to face, there are things he will not say to you. He will want you to discover it through training, through personal development, through knowledge, through impartation. And I mean quality training, quality empowerment. This ministry, you have not done it before. But some people have done it. And God has given them grace to put things down in a structured way, in a structured learning. Go for it. You know, today, a lot of us that want to be trained, we go to universities, we go to secular schools, we do secular courses, we have a secular degree. Yes, I will help you. In a spiritual work, you can use secular training for it. You need spiritual training. You need Bible school training. Yeah, you still need to be trained how to handle Bible. Or else, Bible will kill you. That is if you use it wrongly. You need to know the law of hermeneutics, interpretation of the Bible. That's what many preachers don't know. Unfortunately, in Nigeria here, even most of our biggest pastors, they don't know the Bible. They, they were never taught. They ne were never trained. They just read books online. They read correspondent courses and all those things and do some self-study. As good as that is, that is part of it. But you know what? That's not what Apostle Paul told Timothy. He said those things... You have seen in me. You have received. And you have been taught. Do that. And the God of peace shall be with you. So there is a place for training. Oh, will your church not grow if you are not trained? It will grow. You will gather crowds. But you will never turn them to disciples of the Lord. Oh, so if you are not trained. If you didn't go to Bible school, leadership school, church go school, I want to see if you are not trained, if you are not instructed, you are not monitored, you are not mentored, you are not disciple for this world. Will your ministry not flourish? It will flourish. But the bottom line is that as it goes up, so will it come down. In the day of pushing and shoving, you won't know what to do. Because when church is at peace, everything is working. Well, things will be working. But it will get to a point. There will be crisis and conflict here and there. What will you do? It's your training that will help you. I mean quality training. So one way to improve your capacity, get trained. Oh, did you read your Bible? 2 Timothy 2.15. This book of the law. I mean, no, 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 no. What does it say? Study. Thank you. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly. Uh -huh. There are wrong ways to divide the word of truth. And that's what many of us are doing. That's why many of us preach messages that are not relevant. That's why many of us, we don't know how to take people from point one to point B. We don't know how to grow people in the church. Most pastors love people to just follow them. No, it's because you don't have training. If you are properly trained, you rather make them to follow the law. And you can take them from point A to from, from point B. If I ask you a question... If a sinner get converted in a crusade, thank God you are the one that prayed the crusade and really gave his life to Christ and they come into church, what's the next thing? What's the next structure? What's the next policy? What's the next line to follow? Oh, it's to become a worker. No. You are jumping the gun. You are putting the cart before the horse. No, the next thing is to go to believers class. Do you have anything for believers? New converts? How you can ground them in the faith? How you can follow them up and build them up until you teach them water baptism 
and you take them to the river to baptize them until you bring them to where they can receive Holy Communion. But that's another, that's another battle entirely. We don't know all that. We don't know how to take people step by step. By step. It's because you are not trained. Because you know what? If you have not been discipled, you can't disciple others. Like that popular saying, you can't give what you don't have. If you have not experienced it, you can't give it to others. So training is very important. It's one way to increase your capacity. If you check your manual, it was John Maxwell who told the story. When he came here in 1989, because me, I've been a conference guy for many, many years. When John Maxwell came here in 1989, from there I built a personal relationship with him. So I was writing him. But let me stop it there. But he told a story there. One of the stories I will not forget. He gave us the material. I said, I have the material. We bought the material there, 10 Naira. That's when Naira was Naira. We bought it 10 Naira. Okay, I can bring it down tomorrow to show it to you. Far away, new, I won't give you. Just to show you. Only few people have that kind of material. But it's a material of 1989. Equipping leaders for the 90s. It was just for pastors and leaders. I was just a young pastor. Just finished my first Bible school by then. But when I heard that John Maxwell is coming, wow. I went there. I paid. How much did we pay by then? I think it's about that uh, 5 naira or 10 naira. If you are going to have the material. But 10 naira by, ten, by then was something like... Uh, 10,000 now. So he said something that he was transferred to one church. And when he got to that church, that church has or, already has 1,000 members. And he said he wants to grow that church to a 5,000 member church. That's the vision he brought. So the first thing he did, he said he called all the workers and told them, I thank God for your life. You have been able to lead this church to a thousand member church. I celebrate you. But how many of you have the capacity to help me lead this church to a 5,000 strong member church? They say we don't have that. We don't know how. They say, okay, will you agree me to train you? That's why he instituted training. And he led that church to that. But he put training first. Because if you don't know what to do, you can't know when you arrive. At your destination. Training will help your capacity improvement. Because training will equip your hand. Training will shine your eye. Training will clarify God's purpose in your heart. Training will align you what to do step by step. So if you still want to be trained, thank God for this conference. But this is the invitation. This is just invitation. This conference is an invitation. So if you haven't been to our school, thank God next week Monday we are coming. I mean, we are resuming. Thank God our classes are here now. Come and resume. Come and resume at our advanced diploma. I don't say pay first, so don't pay. Don't pay for the first two weeks. In fact, if you like, don't pay for the next one month. We won't drive you. But the drivers are there that will drive you. But what I'm saying is that when you come for one month and you don't see improvement in your life, in your ministry, go away. But return our outline. Provided you have not write anything in it. If you write anything in it, you pay for what you wrote there and you pay for the outline. I will collect it. Benny, she is our own. Are you the writer? Amen. Training is very crucial. I remember I said that to one pastor. I think he's from Baptist. He said he has his doctorate in theology already. That's what he told me. Because he has gone through the interview. So he was saying he's going for the doctorate in church growth. And they told him he can't go for it. That he has to start from advanced diploma. That is a different discipline entirely from theology. He said no. So they asked him to come and see me. So he came. He argued his way also. Yes, I have my PhD from the most prestigious Bible school in Nigeria. Even from abroad also. I said fine and beautiful sir. And you want to learn church growth? He said yes sir. I say you have to start from advanced diploma. He said, no, that's too low. I say, sorry, we don't sell certificates here. It's the knowledge and the skill. 
and the capacity that we want to want God to help us deposit in you. That's what we sell here, not your not the certificate. He argued this way, but how I want him. I said, okay, let's strike a deal. If you come for one month or at most the very first semester, two months, come every day. Those are eight lecture days. Every Monday you come. Make sure you are in class. Make sure you buy the outline. Don't pay any money yet. And if you pay any money, if they ask for any money, just pay. But note what you pay. Collect receipt for what you pay. Because after two months, if all you learn and what they taught you, I'll refund your money with interest. He said, you do that. I said, you, it's a promise, sir. He said, okay. I will go for it. And you know what I did? I don't want to I don't want to refund that money. But I didn't tell him that. So every Monday I will fast and pray. When is my turn in the class? Mama to be a Jew. I'll be teaching. And you know, whenever I'm in class and I prayed very well, there's this sickness that afflicts me. I always teach what is not in the outline. I always teach what is not in the outline. I call it concussion. So I'll come to class. I say, thank God for your outline. Thank God for your outline. But I want to give you something that is not in your outline. So take your Bible and write concussion. I was doing principally because of him. And I was receiving a lot of him. <laughs> He'll be shaking his head. Before, he will not write anything. After some weeks, he started writing. After some time, I said, Pastor, you are writing. He says, be careful. Leave me alone. <laughs> now, at the end of two months, I said, sir. He was coming in. I, stu I stood at the door. I said, please, sir. You need to stop this course today. Show me your receipt. How, have you, how much have you paid? I'm ready with the money. Even the interest. He said, why are you? Yes, sir. Don't become a hindrance. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, I've learned what I've never learned in my life. I said, but it's just advanced. He said, yes. And I want to do it to your doctorate. I said, no. That's backsliding. He said, no, sir. I am front sliding. I mean, if you are not backing, you should front him. And he finished it and come and see his church is growing to today because he went and applied because they are relevant principles. I'm sorry for those who came to the school and they never applied to their life. With all the outline they have, they have all the outline. You know, because some people love to boast. Akijo, Akijo, what's he teaching? I have everything. I'll be there. Where is the evidence in your life and your ministry? Because it's meant to give you evidence. It's not the degree that matters, it's the skill, it's the capacity. That we have deposited in your life. So if you have not come, please come. It's coming Monday. Come and register. Training. And anywhere you can see quality training that will improve your leadership, improve your skill, improve your capacity as a minister of the gospel, please go for it. Don't mind the amount. Uh, what are they charging? Ah. Uh, if you say knowledge, it's very expensive. Try the price of ignorance. And in 21st century, you can't afford to be ignorant. Did you hear what uh, Okwok taught? That you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit and you need wisdom to disseminate the world. That's the knowledge of the world. That's a skill to lead the church. So number one, what's my number one? Pardon? Condition of your heart will improve your capacity. Number two, your training. The training. I know training is continuous, sir. Training is forever. It will increase your capacity. You might not know, but it will increase your capacity. I believe so much in training that me too am still going for training. If not for COVID, that stopped traveling. I could have gone for my second. There's a training I enter. It's a 10-year training. And we do it in Thailand. Imagine how much it will cost. And you go on your own cost. Nobody sponsors you. Nobody sponsors you. You go on your own cost. And what your eye will see before they will can give you Thailand visa from Nigeria. Man, have you tried it before? <laughs> when we were going, they say we must first get, go to NDLEA at Hansworth, Ikoyi. And those who are on, they take your form, everything, then they'll come and search your house, search your family. 
They came to my house oh, because if you give them wrong address, you have failed it. So they came to my house. They interviewed my wife. They interviewed my children. The one that was not at home, they say, where is he? And you must give cogent reason and give them phone number. They came to the office. So after they complete all that, then you went for the interview. They will look you over, look you over, psych you over. And their office, man, is a photocopy office. You know what I mean by that? There are secret cameras everywhere watching you as they are interviewing you. The moment you enter their gate, if you pass through that, then you go to the Ministry of Justice. They must give you a letter. When you get to the Ministry of Justice, they must size you over and see you and warn you. Because in Thailand, if they discover just 10 kilograms of cocaine, no appeal. So Nigeria had to set up a lot of committee. And they warn you, don't go and die. Your parents still love you. Your wife still love you. <laughs> and if anybody give you anything on the way, say, yes, please help me carry. Don't carry you. If I don't let anybody pick your bag for you, pick it by yourself. Then after that one, if you pass through those two, three steps, then you now face up. Before you pass through that two, three, it's about two, three months. So. Then you now face Abuja. In my own group, there were six of us. And all of you must appear at the same time. Me, I was tired of all that process. Kilo de gun, I haven't lost one gun to Letele. Why? Is it not ordinary Thailand here? I'm not going, Jari. So when I see my other five people, they went to Abuja. I said, me, I'm not going. I just gave Reverend Faladu. I gave him my passport. Gave him all the approval. Gave him everything. Pay part of his uh, uh, ticket to fly to Abuja. They said, me, go. I said, I'm not going. If they lie, let them give me. If they don't give me, I'm OK. You know they're going now? Uh-uh. Or -uh. And they went. Look at surprise of surprise. The whole five that appeared, they never gave it to them. It's me that didn't appear, they gave it to. I don't know what they saw. But they just said, that one that didn't come, and everything is complete with him, it is him we will give it to. It shows that he doesn't have fear, he didn't fear us. He's sure of himself. All of you that appear, we are not giving it to you. But it's not only them. There were about 98. Is it 98 or 68? Nigerians that applied for that conference they gave it to only two and I happened to be one of them and I didn't show up at the embassy it means it is God that prepared it so when Faladu came back and gave me my passport say see they gave you visa that even him they didn't give to him I said with all that process oh within me I said I think God wants me to go so I set up my mind to get ready to pick everything they are going to teach in that conference. And it's a one week intensive conference. We'll leave hotel 6 a.m. We'll return 9 30 p.m. And if I've ever been to that, uh, what's the headquarters of uh, Thailand? Uh, Bangkok. If I've ever been to Bangkok, man, it's even worse than Lagos. I mean, the traffic. Imagine we leave hotel 6 a.m. If you want to go for breakfast, go for breakfast. And if the buses come, they didn't catch you by 6.30, you didn't join, you will trek. And it's not a place to trek. Oh. It's like we are going to Ikoyi, and we are moving from here on a work day against traffic. I mean, joining traffic. Sometimes we spend two hours in traffic. I remember one day we spent three hours in traffic. And the moment you arrive, conference has started. You'll be going to seminar rooms. And the speakers will be speaking and everything. I was writing. You know, when I came back after one week, and you had to fly 16 hours back, 16 hours go on your own ticket. I have a stopover at Dubai. After here, eight hours to Dubai. And if your plane moves very well, maybe eight hours, uh, 10 minutes, uh, seven hours, 15 minutes, wherever. But when you get there, from Dubai to Thailand, solid nine, nine hours. When I came back, I knew I've gone to something. Not that they speak new things, but I saw new insights. I saw new ways of doing this work. It's about pastoral training. And what I brought back from there, 
My brethren, it has increased our training capacity. That's the point. In fact, when I sat down after I prayed, I was able to make about 26 outlines out of what I brought back. Yeah. If you go to our website today, or you go to our Facebook group, Pahek, Pastoral Trainers, pa okay, Pastoral something, healthy pastors training. You see the materials there. If you pay for them, you can get 26 of them. But I got it from training. I didn't learn it in a Bible school. So get trained. Number three, prayer intercession. Prayer and intercession. That's what we increase your capacity. And that's why we are adding a lot of prayer to this conference. That's why we are praying that our prayer life will increase. Prayer intercession. Make sure you pray. You do spiritual warfare. And you spend time in prayer. Spend time in the presence of the Lord. Take time to pray. Take time to seek the Lord. All backsliding start from the prayer room. Once you can no longer pray, Esa is the beginning of backsliding. And if you want to come back, come back from your prayer life. Build a prayer life. You hear what Apostle Okwok said? Build the church to pray. If you can copy that uh, six to six, that would be amazing. If you can do it on Saturday, do it on Sunday. If you can do days of fasting and prayer, that would be amazing. But before the congregation, let it start from you. It takes more grace to maintain a consistent prayer life. It takes grace. To wake up early in the morning and pray, that's why it's not easy. Sometimes you take a half day to pray, that's why it takes grace. Sometimes you have to do fasting, it takes grace. Either morning to evening fasting, either two days fasting, either three days fasting, or seven day dry fasting, or you are drinking water, or you are drinking juice, whatever. It takes grace. And when you backslide from there, you are backslide from everything. May we receive grace to come back to our prayer life. Is then God will increase your capacity. Because what God will give a praying man, a praying woman, he will not give it to a prayerless man or a prayerless pastor. Let's stand up on our feet. That's how to improve your capacity. That's how to increase your capacity. You can study the rest of the manual. If you want your church to come back, your ministry to be alive, prayer intercession. You can build prayer warriors. You can build intercessor. But you yourself, go and pray. Go and read the books of people like Praying Hate. Go and read the books of people like uh, John Knox, John Wesley. Yes, people prayed. Until they saw angel Kurokoro. Even in our Africa here, go and read people books. Thank God the books are available. Like Babalola and the rest of the CAC fathers. Go and read their books. More than any other thing, they were men and women that prayed. And they spent time in prayer. Create time to pray. And if I may help you, I read a proverb or a poem about prayer life of ministers. Maybe it will help you. It says, Divorce daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually. Divorce daily is not everything you want to do that you can do in a day. Abandon some of them, divorce some of them so that you can pray. Don't joke with your prayer life. Everything we want to take away your prayer life. In ministry, tiredness, go for your prayer life. That's what Jesus did. And weekly, have a day. That you pray. You may not go out. You may go out. But have a day to pray. At least a day. And if you want to be a power minister. At least you must be having three days of fasting and prayer. In a week. Personally. Not that you are telling anybody. The week you cannot fast two or three days. In that week. Is a backsliding week. Yeah. Not that ah, I've got to my minister. This is the week of eating. No, every week should not be week of itching. After you eat for some time, in the New Testament church, research confirmed that they pray three times, they fast three times a week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. These are days of fasting and prayers. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. That's how to increase your capacity. 
God's capacity is not only human attainment. It is divine endowment. God can give you what you cannot give yourself. For example, you are suddenly made to pastor a large church where there are a lot of children of God, angels, and there are a lot of devils and demons there. You need divine capacity and capability to lead that church very well. Or else, you will scatter the church first. You need to grow first. And the Lord will help us to grow in Jesus' name. Can we raise up our right hand? I receive grace. I receive mercy. To improve. To become better. To receive capacity. To move at the next level. Open your mouth and pray in the name of Jesus.